My dad, Charles Leo Cadell, was born in Johnstown, Pennsylvania on June 8, 1908. He was the son of a steel worker. He enlisted in the Army in the 1930s not to see the world, but to try to make a life for himself. He rose to the rank of Master Sergeant and was a gunner assigned to protect the island of Corregidor in the Philippines. It was there, in 1940, in the city of Manila, that Irish met Leonora. My mom was born Leonora de la Cruz on February 22, 1914. She was one of eight children. My mom met my dad in a club where the GIs went to drink and relax, and according to my mom, it was love at first sight for both of them. Less than a year later, on my dad's birthday, June 8, 1941, they were married. Unfortunately, the honeymoon was short-lived because on December 7, 1941, the day President Roosevelt said would live in infamy, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and plunged my mom, dad, and the world into war. In the early part of 1942, the Japanese began a campaign to invade the Philippines. 14,000 Allied troops defended Corregidor and held out against intense Japanese bombardment from December 1941 until May 6, 1942. Food, water, and ammunition had dropped to critical levels when the Japanese finally secured a beachhead on the island on May 5th and landed tanks. My dad and the remaining survivors of Corregidor and Bataan became prisoners of war. What took place in the days following the surrender is still regarded today as one of the most barbaric and inhumane acts of torture that any human could ever inflict on another human being. My dad, along with 75,000 other American, Australian, British, and Filipino prisoners of war, were forced to march from their places of capture, a distance of 80 miles, in what would later become known as the Bataan Death March. My mom also suffered greatly at the hands of the Japanese during the war. The Japanese routinely came to her house, threatening to kill her with a bayonet pushed to her stomach if she didn't tell them who her American husband was and where he was located. As a result of her belief that the Japanese were superstitious and would not desecrate a religious artifact, she took her marriage certificate and my father's military papers and sewed them into the lining of clothing that adorned figurines of the Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and Jesus that she had in her home. The Japanese never found the papers. My father survived the death march and was packed on a train and sent to Shenyang in Manchuria at a prison camp called Mukden Hoten. He remained a prisoner of war in Manchuria for three years and four months until he was liberated by the Russians on September 7, 1945, after the A-bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of the war. The next part of the story is quite difficult to tell. The GIs were coming back from the prison camps and were scattered all over the Philippines, but mostly in Manila. My dad weighed 145 pounds when he was captured and only 75 pounds when he was freed. My mom set out to find him. She said she went from hospital to hospital, camp to camp, until one day she found him lying on a bed in a camp about 20 miles from her home. She nursed him back to health and soon they were on a ship back to the States. He and she survived all that war could deliver to come home and be my parents. My folks bought a 63-acre farm close to where my dad was born in Johnstown and we lived there from 1955 until he died in 1964. He was only 55 years old. My mom, an immigrant from a faraway country who could barely speak English, was left to raise me. And as I look back on those years, my heart swells with pride and absolute admiration for them. My mom lived until 2001, long enough to see her son graduate from college and law school. She was there for the birth of my son, and she was front row center in 2000 when I was installed as president of the Bar Association of Montgomery County. In the fall of 1963, shortly before my father died, he made an appointment to see our local attorney in a little town a few miles from our house. I believe he knew he was ill and his time here was short. 
and like any good husband and father, he wanted to place his affairs in order. We went into the lawyer's office and were greeted by his secretary, who offered my mom and dad a cup of coffee and me a soft drink. I had never been in an office, and this office was filled with big leather chairs and big, heavy, darkly stained wooden desks. I remember sitting in his library and being surrounded by four huge walls covered with books. When the business was done, I asked my dad who the man was, and he said, he's a lawyer. And I said, what's a lawyer? And he replied, he helps people. And from that day forward, I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. I believe that you can still honor your parents after they have passed away by living your life in a way that would make them proud, by treating all people with courtesy and respect the way that I saw my mom and dad treat people, and by sharing their stories with others so that their lives may live on. Thank you for giving me the opportunity this morning to honor my mom and dad. Since its founding in 1896, the MSBA has featured some very notable leaders. I am honored to stand here today on the shoulders of these outstanding predecessors. The Honorable James McSherry from Frederick was the Chief Judge of the Maryland Court of Appeals when he became our first president. Later in 1922, Albert C. Ritchie became president while serving his first term as Governor of the State of Maryland, a post he would hold until 1935. Ritchie twice ran for, and twice failed to receive, the Democratic nomination for the U.S. presidency. Many MSBA presidents have become federal judges, including W. Calvin Chestnut, Morris A. Soper, Rossell C. Thompson, Norman P. Ramsey, and Roger W. Titus. Many have also served as judges on our highest court, the Court of Appeals of Maryland, including James A. Pierce, Jr., John Peran Briscoe, Reuben Oppenheimer, Stedman Prescott, J. Dudley Diggs, and William J. McWilliams. Many of our presidents have also occupied seats on the circuit court bench around the state. H. Vernon Eaney, MSBA president in 1963-64, went on to serve as president of the 1967 Maryland Constitutional Convention. Mr. Eaney and his immediate successors, MSBA presidents J. DeWeese Carter of Denton and William L. Marbury, Jr., respectively, were the original three incorporators of the MSBA in March 1965. This dedication to serving the interests of MSBA members remains just as strong today. As the Honorable J. Michael Conroy, MSBA President in 2005-2006 noted, we will advocate for our members in every way we can to improve the quality and enjoyment of their practice of law. It is a never-ending task to be sure. As a Bar Association, we cannot rest on the good works that we have done noted Harry S. Johnson, MSBA's first African-American president. Rather, he said, we must continue to overcome obstacles and to measure our success by how well we serve our members. Likewise, the association's devotion to our justice system itself remains steadfast. We care about the rule of law, said President Edward J. Gillis. We will be the voice to protect an impartial judiciary and an independent legal profession, and we will continue to celebrate the importance of our profession in ensuring the freedoms of all. His successor, Allison Asty, stressed the importance of MSBA's role in preparing the next generation of lawyers. Our future as a society and as a profession, she said, depends upon the ability of today's young people to understand and respect the principles upon which our legal system was established. Looking forward, our immediate past president, Henry E. Dugan, reminded us of the importance of our legacy to society. 
Although our law business may demand of us a daily realistic pragmatism, our law profession demands of us an idealistic philosophy of law, he stated. Without it, we are a ramshackle collection of empty suits, signifying nothing. President Catherine Kelly Howard underscored her belief that each member of the MSBA has a real feeling that the law truly is a calling and that each of you, regardless of the type of practice you have chosen, has heeded the call to serve others through your knowledge of the law. The MSBA is the voice and the public face of Maryland lawyers, in the words of President Thomas C. Cardero. In its 117 years, our association has enjoyed a rich history, led by many of the greatest lawyers, judges, and leaders in our state. As such, we have been blessed by the efforts and intelligence of these past leaders, who have built such a strong foundation and organization, which is highly regarded with respect and pride among both its members and the public.